Next, it is my very special pleasure to introduce our plenary special, uh, speaker today, uh, Professor Susanne Feuzig from the University of Mainz in Germany. She runs a highly productive research group there, um, and the work is on display throughout this conference. Um, and full disclosure, Susanne and I actually met a few years ago at the University of Würzburg. Um, where she was my senior, she was a few years ahead um, in as a student in Bert Holdobel's lab, and you know I admired her work and and a positive attitude and dedication. Then I still do admire her work and a positive attitude, and so it is my very special pleasure um, to introduce her today. Um, Suzanne is probably best known about um, for her sociobiological, evolutionary, and ecological work on temnothorax, ants, and related genera. Um, and her over 120 publications to date span a much wider range, uh, which makes made me look at the titles and topics. Um, and I'm happy to say most recently, she has published a lot of things about aging and even a publication on honeybees. So that makes yes. me very happy, of course. Um, so, I'm, I'm very excited to learn what she is going to share with us today, and I'm happy to hand over the virtual microphone to her. So please take it. Thanks, Olaf, um, for um, allowing me to give the plenary. So one second, I will share my screen. Um, I hope you all can see what I can see, some nice Timothorax ends. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me to this conference. I am, we have been enjoying the talks um, over the last two days greatly. And today I want to talk about the evolutionary genomics of behavior and life history strategies in Temnothorax ants, which is somehow, I guess, my favorite study organism. Um, and I want to cover four different aspects, division of labor, co-evolution of slave making ants and their host. We look into parasite manipulation and in the end at the molecular regulation of longevity and fecundity. Sorry, today no bees, Olaf. Um, I hope that's okay, but at least I presented a nice study yesterday. Okay, let's start with division of labor. Um, well, division of labor is an organizational principle which is highly successful in nature and also in human societies. It's widespread and it's especially common in eusocial insects. Um, it's also part of three of the major evolutionary transitions. And already um, Adam Smith uh, wrote in his book on 1776, uh, that division that societies that show a higher division of labor are actually more productive. And that uh, this is because individuals kind of, when they specialize, become more efficient in doing a certain task. Well, we find division of labor not only among reproductives and workers, but also among the different workers which specialize on different tasks. And we know by now that uh, this uh, um, self-organization or organization of division of labor is regulated with our task thresholds, which in turn are influenced by age, experience, fertility, and sometimes also genes. Especially in honeybee, we know how um, food care and foraging is regulated via the expression of vitalogenin and also the juvenile hormone titer. There were a number of uh, papers on temnothorax ants which indicated that age might not be so important in, in regulating division of labor. So we had a new look at that in the end, uh, temnothorax um, longispinosus, and this is the work of PhD student uh, Philip Kohlmeier. But we found what we would expect to find that young workers actually do the food care, older workers care for nest mates and go out to forage. Uh, so, so far, no surprise. Um, the next thing we wanted to know is how flexible are workers. So what we did is we disentangled age from task by either taking away all the young workers or all the old workers or half of both. And then we waited three weeks until workers uh, adjusted um, to uh, the new conditions and, uh, and then uh, checked their behavior. When we actually did this, we found that um, it was very difficult to get young workers to go out and forage, whereas we get um, old workers easily to go back inside and take over brood care. And also we saw them actually moving more in the uh, central direction. Nevertheless, we had enough young uh, and old foragers and young and old brood carers to be able to sample basically tasks independent of age. And also we looked at worker fertility. So we had three factors which we could disentangle. Um, and then we analyzed their gene expression to see whether uh, gene expression is mainly influenced by what the ants do or how old they are. And we also went into analyzing um, how those genes are regulated. Mm. 
So in total, we had 48 transcriptomes, and we found, um, lo and behold, that actually behavior influences gene expression much more strongly than age and fertil uh, or fertility. So all comparisons we did uh, really indicated that individuals of the same age but different behavior showed much more differences in gene expression than the other comparison. Um, so what an ANS does really influences which genes are expressed in its body. One of the most interesting candidate genes and the most highly differentially expressed gene of all was vitellogenin like A, and it was upregulated in root carers. Well, vitellogenins are known to influence uh, um, root care behavior in um, uh, the honeybee, so we were not surprised. But actually, in ants, vitellogenins duplicated, and there are several copies, and we could already show before. So some of these vitellogenins are upregulated in queens, and other copies of the logs are, uh, or other vitellogenin genes are upregulated in workers. So we did a phylogenetic tree of all the vitellogenins we could find in the literature, and actually discovered five different groups, and our candidate gene was not the same as the one known in honeybees. So the honeybee vitellogenin clusters here in this cluster, which we call conventional vitellogenins, whether the one we discovered to be upregulated in brood carriers was actually found up here uh, among the vitellogenin like A's. Um, so we next, we wanted to see what directly the function of this gene is. So we downregulated it um, using um, RNAi and um, um, we did this by feeding double-stranded RNA, um, and we could downregulate the expression of this gene by 70% um, in the fat body of those workers. Um, we then did this and observed the behavior, and lo and behold, we find a strong downregulation of boot care behavior in those individuals where we downregulated vitiligen like, like A. Um, we did a cross-fostering experiment to ensure that this is not affecting the larval behavior, but that our effect is really due to workers behaving differently. And therefore, we cross-fostered larvae, which were treated with a downregulated uh, double-stranded RNA, and uh, workers, which were not treated in the other way around. And this shows that it's indeed affecting worker behavior. Um, so, um, did we find an increase in foraging behavior? No, we did not. Um, we did find that workers where we downregulated the gene were less were, uh, afraid of, of light. And we found that over long term downregulation, that they actually increased uh, uh, nest make care behavior. So, they did do behavioral progression, just not to the extent that they started really foraging. But when we think of food care and nest mate care behavior, it's actually very similar behavior, only the recipient of the behavior changes. And um, so the qu uh, question then, uh, is VG like A actually altering Q responsiveness? And so we did an experiment with a brood and nest mate Q. So we extracted the critical hydrocarbons of workers and larvae, and then offered this a worker which was either treated with um, um, double standard RNA of VG like A or the control. And we found that actually we could shift the response and they shifted the response for being interested in larva to be interested in more adult worker cues. So we indeed uh, saw that their responsiveness to this um, uh, shifted uh, with our downregulation. But uh, which uh, gene regulatory mechanisms are affecting the expression of those genes? And uh, here we looked at a, a paper from Simola et al. in 2016, which showed that foraging behavior in Camponotus and seems to be affected by histone acetyl transferases. So we actually inhibited uh, the histone acetyl transferase by feeding C646, a chemical inhibitor of this um, histone acetyl transferase, and then uh, forced workers again by removing foragers and nurses to shift their behavior. If we did our control removing both of both cars, we actually didn't show any difference in behavior when we treat them with this C646. However, when we um, forced young workers, which you can see here, to um, uh, become foragers because we removed all foragers, we see that actually six, C646 treated individuals started to forage much more. Um, if we did the reverse, forcing old workers to go back inside to do root care, we actually impeded that process. So to summarize here is the conditions we remove all the foragers. So young workers should now start to do foraging. If we inhibit the histone acetyl transferase, they kind of become super foragers. And if we do the reverse, um, we actually see that we impede by um, the inhibition, we impede the process. So this seems to suggest that histone acetyl transferase activity keeps workers in a brood carrying mode, if you wish. 
Maybe it, it uh, prevents young workers to leave the nest too early in their life. But it's somewhat contradictory to what has been found in Camponotus and where the inhibition actually lowers the age dependent shift towards foraging. Well, which genes are actually regulated with, via histone acetylation, we don't know yet, but we developed a chip seek protocol in our lab and currently our samples are actually being sequenced, so I can give you the answer in a, in a short while. We did another experiment using the same method, inhibiting histone acetyl transferase with C646, but here in the context of daily rhythms. Um, um, so what we saw is that the ants are more active during the day than during the night. Um, and when we feed them with C646, they actually decrease the amplitude. So we have less strong uh, daily rhythms. And then we did something which you all do to us at the moment. We forced the ants to move six hours forward, basically. So they fly from, New, uh, from Paris to New York. And here we saw that C646 ants are actually unable to do this. Um, so they still had some rhythm, but they couldn't fast forward the six hour, suggesting that somehow these daily rhythms are regulated via histone acetylation. So to sum up that part of my talk, we showed the typical age polyethism in temnothorax ants. Worker gene expression was more affected by tasks than by age of fertility. Um, Vitalogenin like A, the gene which is most uh, highly expressed in uh, brood carers, um, uh, is expressed in the fat body and affects social cue responsiveness. And if we downregulate it, we get a behavioral progression from brood to nest mate care. And it seems that histone acetylation plays a role in this dynamic responsing to changing conditions, whether it's colony demography or the daily rhythm. So, so much to division of labor. My next chapter is one of my favorite, obviously, the evolution of slave making ants and their hosts. Um, here we have been studying a, a clade of these ants, including three slave making ant species and three host species which they exploit. They are obligate social parasites and slavery evolved independently twice in this clade. They exploit the social behavior of the host um, and the slave makers lost typical worker behavior. Instead, they conduct frequent and quite destructive weights on the host. And because these weights and cure strong fitness costs for the host, we see coevolutionary arms races, which lead to the evol evolution of defense traits. Um, we documented a number of them, including slave rebellion. Um, here now I want to talk about a project where we looked at the interaction between the slave maker Tematorax americanus and its whole Tematorax longispinosus. In this study, we wanted to uh, understand um, how the interaction between the slave maker and host is dependent on where the slave maker is from or where the host is from. And indeed, we actually looked, at, uh, um, we uh, took uh, eight different host populations and four different uh, parasite uh, populations, which were the same as the host population in four cases, obviously. Um, and then we did cross-fostering experiments, allowing slave makers to intrude host colonies from all other different populations to be able to disentangle the, uh, the origin of parasite and host. Uh, we did then uh, brain transcriptomes, in addition to observing the behavior and the particular hydrocarbons. We used parasite prevalence in the local community as a measure to um, look at parasite pressure. So when slave makers are super common relative to host, we said there was a high parasite pressure on the host. But you can also do, say the reverse. Basically, the slave maker is highly successful because it's super common relative to the host. Um, so when we observe the behavior, we found actually that the percentage of host workers that defend the nest against the intruding slave maker dependent on the parasite success of the population where the slave maker is from and colony size. Similarly, whether after 24 hours, slave maker was still pinned, that is kind of fixated by the defending host workers, depended on how successful or how common slave makers are in the source population of the slave maker, whether there was no effect on parasite pressure. So then we wanted to understand, so why are some slave makers so, more, uh, su uh, so uh, successful and others are not? And um, we analyzed the particular hydrocarbons and we could uh, find that slave makers from sites where they are super common actually carry less recognition substances, which are in this case methylated hydrocarbons on their cuticle. So they somehow undergo the radar of the host colony. When we looked at gene expression in the brain, we again find that parasite success, also the success rate of the parasite in their local population, and also whether the slave maker was attacked or not by the host, explains most of the gene expression in the brain of the host. Um, indeed, we found actually 400 differently expressed genes, and they, uh, there was a large overlap between those which um, 
um, showed whether the slave maker was attacked or not. Um, the VGCNA analysis confirmed this, that we had modules being associated with parasite success and slave maker attack state, but not with parasite pressure. And when we then looked at uh, the geo enrichment, we found, for example, signal the, the transduction in host workers which uh, encountered highly successful slave makers. So to sum up this part, we found that host defense behavior and brain gene expression during slave maker intrusion depended on parasite success, but not on parasite pressure. So if you think of it, then actually the gene expression in the brain of host workers dependent on which slave makers they encounter, so where the slave maker is from, but not where they are from the, themselves, um, which I find rather interesting. We found also overlap in the differentially expressed genes, which uh, with another study, and um, so basically slave makers from less successful local elicit host responses as a doing away. So basically they uh, got the host colonies in, uh, uh, in uproar, and then we see kind of aggression genes and so on being expressed. In another study, we compare gene expression in tandem running host workers doing foraging and slave maker doing a raid because we wanted to see whether kind of slave makers are just uh, kind of doing foraging just in a different way. However, we found there very little overlap. We found, however, in tandem uh, in scouts and tandem leaders, a lot of memory and learning genes to be overexpressed, and we did so both in the slave maker as in the host. So as tandem running has been described as a teaching behavior that makes a lot of sense. Um, we did a number of comparative transcriptome studies comparing the three slave maker species and the three host species. The slave makers in a waiting and non waiting state, and the same for the host in a defending and non defending state. However, we found uh, very few convergent changes in gene expression between the different species. And also, when Barbara Feldmeier did a, a selected gene analysis based on this data set, she found actually less uh, genes under selection commonly in the same in the slave makers and the same for the host. This suggests that we have a lot of species specific trajectories. Um, however, we have a few evidence that sometimes things go in the same direction. For one thing, when we look at gene expression in queens and workers of the slave makers and hosts, comparing here, I think seven slave makers and six host species, we find that slave makers have less past divergence in gene expression between workers and queens than the hosts have. And, and this is a very cool data set where we uh, did the genomes from three slave makers and three hosts and annotated already the gustatory and odorant receptors. And here we could show that slave makers actually lost about a quarter of their odorant receptors and a, a more than half of their gustatory. Uh, gustatory receptors compared to the host. And actually here we found evidence for convergent losses of odorant receptors. And if you want to know more about this, visit the poster by Alice and Evelyn here at the conference. So this sums up my slave maker part. And now I want to go on and talk again about parasites, but this time it's about real and non-social parasites. Well, we know that parasites can manipulate host behavior and their life histories. These are just uh, fascination, uh, fascinating natural history stories, and I'm sure you know a lot about them. Why do parasites do that? Well, in most cases, they want to facilitate transmission to the definite host. And they're often parasites with rather complex life cycles. Um, the question is, how do they do that? And we analyze this in a, in a species um, where the parasite is a cestode, Anomotenia previs, um, and it lives in an ant, or well, the Temnothorax ant, you would have guessed it, uh, Temnothorax nilanderi from Europe. Um, the final host are woodpeckers. Well, the ants feed bird feces to the, with the cestode eggs in it to the larvae, and once the infected larvae emerge as adults, they have this yellowish um, cuticle, this is unpigmented and much uh, less thick. Um, the cestode then develop into cystocercoids, which attaches to the ants' guts, but actually float in the hemolymph. And then eventually the woodpecker comes along, opens the acorn, eats the tendothorax, and gets infected. So in a number of studies, we could show that infected workers show very deviant um, phenotypes. So they are smaller, they stay close to the brood, they rest more and work less, and they are more often fed. They remain in the nest when we open the acorn. Everybody is running away except the infected workers, which stay close by. Um, when we remove the queen, these infected workers are able to develop their ovaries and lay eggs, and they show an increased survival. We also found phenotypic changes in workers living with infected ones. They show a lower aggression and actually decreased survival. 
So we look at this effect on survival in a long-term study over three years where we marked newly emerged workers. Only infected workers and queens were already alive when we started the experiment, so we don't know that determined age. But these three two groups, the infected workers and the queens, actually lived much longer. So over 50% are still alive after three uh, years, where, whereas all the other workers were dead. And again, workers which are healthy themselves but live with infected workers die at higher rates than the ones which live in totally uninfected nests. But the surprising thing was really that infected workers survive as well as the queens, which actually was very surprising for me. Um, because Thanatholax workers can live up to 20 years, we were wondering what does a parasite do to these infected ants that they can live so long? Do they actually show a physiology which is similar to that of the queen? And actually our analysis of metabolic weight and lipid content doesn't suggest that. Rather, infected workers resemble uh, nurses, that is, young workers. Um, they actually receive a lot of social care, more care than even the queen. Um, maybe because they are resources unlimited, they are able to kind of remain in this um, um, uh, in this uh, um, young uh, physiological young state. We have one bit of evidence suggests that something similar to the queen is going on, and this is that in honeybee queens we know that they are more resistant to oxidative stress than workers. And we did do some experiments with paraquat inducing oxidative stress experimentally, and we could see that infected workers actually survive this quite well, whereas the normal workers don't. So maybe they have, I don't know, a higher oxidative stress resistance. Well, the next thing is we, which we did is really looking at gene expression. So we think that this increase in lifespan can profit, uh, that, that the parasite can profit from it because it increases the time for a woodpecker to come along and eat the ants so that the life cycle can basically um, uh, finish. So here the parasite could play as a puppet player. And we wanted to see on a molecular level what is changed. The first study we did was looking at brain gene expression. And here we find about 400 differentially expressed genes. Among them, a number of genes which are actually known to, to help against the fight against oxidative stress and aging in infected workers. Also, we found in infected workers a downregulation of muscle genes, which led us to analyze their muscles. And lo and behold, we find that infected workers have actually a lot of gaps in their muscles, and either because they are old or they never really develop the normal muscle structure. This may explain their inactivity. Okay, in a new study, we looked at brain, uh, gaster transcriptomes now, and here we directly comp uh, compared uh, infected workers to queens. We did not find too many genes which were commonly upregulated in infected workers and queens, but there was one a carbo carboxypeptidase B-like, which is known in Prosophila melanogaster to postpone senescence. Um, uh, queens and infected workers actually overexpress a lot of genes with immunity functionality. We also in the study looked at the testud itself and we found that the testud expressed a lot of this um, uh, mitochondrial respiratory chain genes like cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1, 2, and 3, which suggests a highly active metabolism. It somehow needs a lot of ATP, I guess, in this stage. Um, and the final study we did on the system was looking uh, with proteomics at the hemolymph of infected worker, healthy workers, and the testoid. And we found a number of uh, proteins of the testoid in the hemolymph of infected workers. And we are currently analyzing what are the function of these proteins. There were several of superoxidase dismutases among them, which are actually uh, have an antioxidant uh, functionality and are linked to a long lifespan in Drosophila. We also found those to be overexpressed in ant queens. Um, and a seroreduxine, which also conveys and, uh, ox uh, oxidative stress resistance and slows down aging. So it seems that the testo somehow is releasing proteins into the ant, which helps the ant to find oxidative, uh, to fight oxidative stress. So to sum up this part, um, infection by the testoid anomotenia previs induces changes in behavior, particular hydrocarbons, morphology, and lifespan. Infected workers live longer and show survival rate similar to that of queens, probably because this increases the likelihood that uh, the parasite reaches the final host. Infected workers remain in a physiological young state, if you can say so. They maintain a high reproductive potential. Uh, there is no host castration. They receive most care from the nestmates and upregulate longevity genes, including like transferrin or carboxybutase B like. And the test is releasing protein into the host with antioxidant properties. And if you know, want to know more about the system, visit uh, our PhD student, Tom Sisterman, who works on this. 
Okay, and my final chapter for today looks at the molecular regulation of longevity and fecundity. Well, why do we age is a question we all want to know. Um, and um, actually, the evolution of lifespan is uh, linked to extrinsic mortality risks. And in most species, it's traded off with reproduction. Um, however, social insects are an exception to this. So the queens are the most long-lived and the most fecund individual in the colony. Um, and even if we compare within a caste, we find that more frequent queens live longer or fertile workers live longer. So that fecundity and longevity seem to be positively associated. We experimentally analyzed this. Um, so why can uh, um, uh, queens actually live so long? Well, they have a lower extrinsic mortality. I mean, they live in the safety of the nest. They upregulate the number of longevity pathways and they seem, are seemingly resistant to oxidative stress at a higher level. So we looked at gene expression changes with aging and queens, comparing young and actually middle-aged queens, if you wish. And we looked at two different tissues, brain and fat body, to find that actually more genes shift their uh, expression with age in the fat body than in the brain, with little tissue um, overlap. Um, young queens invest in immunity and starvation resistance genes, whereas we found an upregulation of genes involved in oxidative stress regulation, such as the superoxidant dismutase I mentioned before. We then experimentally manipulated the system by um, um, increasing the fecundity or manipulating the fecundity of ant queens, either by dietary restriction or by removing the eggs. When we remove the eggs, the queens lay more eggs and become actually more fecund. Um, and then we looked at gene expression in the fat body. And then if we did so, we actually found that queens which are more fecund are also investing more in body maintenance genes, including like sectostome 1 or DNA ligases. We didn't find a difference in queen survival, and this is because nearly no queen died. I think we had two dead queens over the entire study. Um, so we turned to workers to actually look at the direct link between fecundity and longevity. And by now we actually have four studies which look at that in tenothorax ants, and all of those four studies show that workers live longer if you remove the queen. Um, they also develop their ovaries and at least some of them start uh, laying eggs. Um, we then see the gene expression uh, shift in the fat body with an upregulation of longevity genes. And uh, in this study, actually, we um, had one group of ants where the fertile workers were allowed to return to the mother colony. And then we uh, sampled them only a few weeks later. But still, we find that they upregulate many more longevity genes, even after uh, kind of reuni reuniting them with the queen. Um, you might have heard the study by Marina Chopin, our PhD students, which look at which regulatory mechanisms affect the expression of these genes. And she could show, um, using C646 again, that histone acetylation also seems to play a role in this context. The final study I want to look at is, uh, um, involves the gut microbiome, which is known as a major regulator of lifespan in other organisms. Um, and it can affect the host's nutritional state, smell, and also the ability to resist um, 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 pathogens. So we wanted to know, does an immune challenge alter the microbiome and does the microbiome change is linked to worker fertility? So what did we do? Again, we used the Antemnothorax rogatulus. We split the colony in two parts to get a queen right and a queen less part for nine weeks. In the queen less parts, workers developed the ovaries. And then we did a control or an immune challenge, which was pricking the ant with a needle, which was uh, dipped in LPS before. Um, Yes, and then we did a transcriptome analysis of the fat body and 16S sequencing of the gut microbiome. So what could we see? Well, we found more genes changing the expression with the immune challenge and a lot of the to be expected immune genes like stephensine, immunoptocene, and so on. We also found about 4,000 uh, contexts here to change with, with fertility. And we found a number of interesting genes which uh, had an interaction. So they only changed the expression if the worker were fertile. Um, Immune challenged workers upregulated immune genes as to be expected. Non challenged workers actually had an enriched function, which was social behavior. And this is very interesting because we recently did another study where we looked at how social isolation affects gene expression in tenothorax ants. And here we found an, a reduction in immunity. So if ants are kind of left alone for four weeks, they downregulate immune genes, which is very similar to what we find in humans. 
But let's look at these interaction genes between fertility and immune challenge. We found that infertile workers react to the immune challenge with an upregulation of stress genes. And also fertile workers upregulate alpha ketoglutarate, um, which is known to downregulate TOR and extends lifespan in uh, C. elegans. So it seems to be infertile workers are more stressed by the immune challenge. Um, we also found that fertile long-lived workers uh, upregulated more repair mechanisms and lifespan genes. Well, let's look at the microbiome. First of all, we find a highly diverse microbiome in this Temnosorax rogatulus ants, but with the immune challenge, we find a considerable reduction in diversity. So a lot of individuals, which you see in the lower part here, actually have only one or two micro, uh, uh, microbes in their gut remaining after 24 hours of the immune challenge. Um, and we found that the expression of immune genes was uh, linked, uh, kind of correlated to the microbiome composition, suggesting that maybe um, because workers upregulate immune genes, they either voluntarily or experimentally or involuntarily downregulate microbiome diversity. To sum up this part, um, we could show as Queen's age, they in, uh, shift their investment from immunity and starvation resistance to the fight against oxidative stress. The experimental upregulation of fecundidine and queens and workers lead to an overexpression of body maintenance genes, showing this positive link between fecundity and longevity. Fertility induction in workers causes life exp uh, lifespan expansion, and it looks like histonate acetylation might play an important role in the regulation of the genes associated with this switch. Fertile workers respond differently to the immune challenge than infertile workers. And the immune challenge per se led to a strong decrease in microbiome diversity. Um, and this is at least linked to the immune gene expression, whether it's causative or it's just both affected by the third factor of the immune challenge, we don't know yet. Um, but if the host is able to actively regulate its bi microbiome, the, um, um, actually the loss in diversity might be a cost because we could show in another study that a high diversity of the microbiome is linked to a higher colony uh, productivity. So the loss in diversity in the microbiome following the immune challenge might actually be a cost for those ants. And I think with this, I'm at the end of my talk. I thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions you might have. I'm actually too we, far. Yeah, thank you, Susanna. That was amazing in its breadth and quantity of um, stuff that you presented at us. Um, and so a big round of virtual applause to you. Um, and there are in, indeed some questions that I quickly want to get to, at least a couple of them. Um, Claire Richoff asks, I believe you mentioned that when slave makers are common, they have lower CHC levels on the cuticle maybe facilitating mm -hmm. nest invasion. How rapid are these CHC dynamics? Could they um, change quickly? With so they don't have less CHCs overall, but they have less of the methylated kind. So we did a study on nest mate recognition in the host, and we found that they mainly recognize each other, or aggression is mainly triggered by the uh, by certain methylated hydrocarbons. And um, slave makers from infected, uh, from highly um, yeah, well, slave makers are super common. They carry less of these methylated ones. Um, we didn't look at the dynamic because um, basically um, what we measured was like in a field, how many slave makers were there and how many hosts. We didn't look at the dynamic change. So I don't know. I think probably it's highly genetic and they cannot switch this, but we don't know. We haven't studied the dynamic, the temporal dynamic. Okay, the next question is from Surthi. Um, well, ask, uh, well, first comments, really amazing talk, but um, I was wondering, do the infected workers forage as usual as normal workers? Are there behaviorally any differences? Um, the infected workers from the test load infection, I guess? Um, no, they never leave the nest. Um, they always stay next to the brood um, and they never leave, no. Even if we open the nest aside, everybody leaves the infected one, it's just like, oh, a, a woodpecker. I guess I get eaten. No, they, they don't leave. All right, I think we have time for one quick last question from Adria, who typed in the chat. Um, do you see these um, SODs and thyroidoxins upregulated in RNA-seq of infected or uninfected workers? Um, 
in, in infected, uh, where, where I did say that we found one of the genes which is associated with oxidative stress res resistance indeed in infected workers to be upregulated. And we also found that the testode is releasing some proteins with this functionality into the end. So we have both kind of self-produced. We don't know why they produce this. So we think that probably the testo is also interfering with gene expression of the host directly, but we don't know this for sure yet. So this is something we are exploiting. Um, yes. Great, thank you. There are many more questions, but I have to move them to Slack and okay. you will be able to discuss them there.